Hello, sorry to bother you. <laughs> You're um, not bothering us, Bob. We no, ask, no, we ask no, people no. to phone in, so no, don't worry no, about that. I'm going to put the cat amongst the pigeons. Oh, dear, here. OK. Right. Now, I'm just an ordinary lad. Yeah. Worked hard all of my life. Took my kids to, I don't know if I can say it, Clivero. They had a private um, place there where my daughter went. Right. Well, people to me at the moment, I'm, I'm 57, OK? People mm. to me... Uh, want, want, want. They want their Netflix. They want their new super duper phones. They want their new BMWs or Audis A3s. They want, they want. And then they expect everybody else to help them out. Well, you have to pull, not not everybody, don't get me wrong, not everybody, but you have to pull your belt in and do without things to do what you have to do. But Bob, and like the average childcare cost is 14 grand. You're not going to be able to, you can cut back your Netflix all you like. You're not going to be able to afford it. Listen, I... I was just working on the beans, right? In Clivero, yeah. Do, with the council wages, and the council wages are very, very poor. And yet, I could do a private school. With but things daughter. have changed. But things have changed. I mean, when was that, Bob? Uh, she's twenty-three now. So when were you? When were you doing that? In uh, well, my average wage was about two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah, but when? So when you, was this? Uh, I moved up north in twenty. To, uh, 2000, I think she was 2000. six months. Yeah, to about 20, 23 years. The housing about, costs are so much more expensive than it was. That, you know, things have changed. Like, it's not that easy. My, don't laugh. My poll tax was dearer in Clipperow than what it was downtown. Well, yeah, okay. I, yeah, of course, there's yeah, always so going to be some variations. But, but, so but, how, but, but housing costs are massively increased in the last 20 years, both in house price costs yes. and rents in relative yes. terms. So, but so it's not the same. They still want their good phones. They still want this. Oh, they come still on, want Bob. That. Like you know, Bob, you can you can get a, look if you if your average cost is fourteen grand, right, for a childcare place, you can have a rubbish phone. You can have yes, no Netflix. Exactly, I did. Well, okay, I fine, did. yeah, but well, smartphones weren't around then. But all right, like oh, you know, I know. I know well, but, I know, no, tell a lie, mate. I had a phone because I was doing Continental beforehand. Okay, uh, but my so point I is, what I'm saying to you, what, what I'm saying to you is, you can cancel your Netflix, whatever that is, eight quid a month. Yeah. You can get a yeah. cheap phone or whatever. It ain't going to amount to fourteen grand. I know, but that you have to pull your strings in. Yeah, but what <laughs> to allow you to do it? Yeah, but what? I, I had to. I wasn't on mega money. I, I I had a cheap little run around car what I bought from the auction for five hundred quid. I run that until it got on its knees, and and I worked my backside off. And that's what we've got to do. But is you it not possible, Bob? Expect- is it not possible, Bob? That there's something wrong. That whatever what you're basically saying is that individual agency matters is most. Is it not possible that the structure doesn't matter how much effort you make? And how much agency mm-hmm. you try yeah. and apply, that the structure of the system is so bust, is so broken, that it doesn't matter yeah, what you it, what you do as an individual. Surely you can yeah, see but that. They've got more help. They've got more help now. And I do agree with that that uh, gentleman saying that his daughter or his child could not get in because they, there's not enough people. Yeah. There's some somewhere along the line something's not right. They, the government should actually just say right. That's how much you get and fund it down, like they do with the doctors. They get so much per child. All right. Okay. And not actually beg money from us, like to beg money to do the job. All right, Bob. Uh, Bob in St. Helens there. Say, perfectly fine, but as I say, you know, I do get a bit frustrated with this argument about Netflix and phones or whatever. This is not modern Britain. Like, it doesn't matter. You, you can get rid of Netflix, you get rid of your phone. When rent is so high, when mortgages are so high, when inflation is so high, when childcare is so high, childcare costs are so high, you can cut that back as you want. But like the sort of slightly boomerish view that, you know, that if everyone, it was just so much, it was just as hard back then as it is now. No, it wasn't. Look at any of the data, any of the metrics. Things are harder now than it was then. I know some of you will be spitting into your afternoon coffee at that, but it is just factually true. The thing is, it's time to let the EU go. They come in the same category as America. They have done nothing for us. Right. Whatever we got out of the, the situation with the EU was that we, the poor people, were subsidising the rich by paying our membership fees so that the businesses could trade. And uh, that, that was... Well, they, well, everyone benefits from trade, don't they, Dave? No, we don't. Well, they, well, they do. If the economy gets He's bigger, sorry, that does benefit it, everybody it in one that. form or another. The poor people don't benefit well, from trade. Well, if the economy is bigger and businesses are trading more, that generates more tax revenue, which the government can then spend on social services and the health service uh, yeah, and education. So everyone does, does benefit from that. It never did. 
I oh, mean, the does. thing is, we left because of, with the bonus, the benefit bonus for EU citizens got too big, and there was no help with, from them. America... Most EU we, citizens uh, were not claiming we, benefits. They were working in the UK uh, and contributing America, tax. America, we p- paid for everything we had from the Second World War onwards. Yeah, and, we paid them uh, back. So I'm not worried about not having a trade deal with them. They're shysters. Then shysters. What, our biggest uh, ally? Our biggest, uh, our biggest, uh, the, 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 country the, that's, the country that's helping keep Europe, Europe safe, fighting they're, Russia? They're, well, why do we have to fight Russia? Well, because they're, they're invading, invading a sovereign Russia democracy. They're invading a sovereign democracy with 40 million people who want to stay free. Well... Not our problem, uh, Dave. Not our problem. Shrug our shoulders. Forget you know, them. Let's that, put it this way. Our wealth came from the Pacific, from China, Asia. What? And, yeah, the, our Britain's wealth came wealth from, the, the, from the Pacific. The EU, what, rather than the Atlantic? From, chi- from Asia and, and Africa. And uh, we will need to get back there. The thing what is, we're going to do? If we, build, if we build up trade with the Pacific... Right. I would hate to say that. Thousands and thousands of miles away. Arms off to get us back in. Thousands and thousands of miles away. Countries in the yeah, Pacific, as opposed uh, no, to, I don't know, don't check my notes, France, it. which is like, you know, 20 <laughs> miles away. You are, you are frightened, easily frightened by irrelevant by facts. things. The thing is, we need to expand and get back into the world and not in a... We, we, we never left the world. Part. What does that mean? We never left the world. We were always in the world. We're all yeah. in the world. We were always tied because of the EU. Uh, they held us back. The and, EU, uh, we negotiate, we, the we negotiated EU trade deals with the EU, and, and then, well, hang on a minute. Most of the trade deals, most of the trade deals that we now have are rollover deals negotiated by checks notes, the EU, when we were in the EU. So how were they holding us back? Because the deals weren't good enough. Well, they don't have an they American the trade deal. They don't have a US trade deal. And trade. guess what? Outside of the EU, neither do we. We need to trade with separate sovereign partners. We need our sovereignty to get. We've got it. it. We've got our sovereignty, and what are we no, doing we with haven't. it? Yes, we have. But, no, but t- we tell, have I tell you what, Dave. Sovereignty. Tell, tell, we tell. We can't control our borders. Well, we can. They're just choosing not to. We can. Because freedom well, of movement means they shove them everybody towards us. But we haven't got freedom of movement at the no, moment. No, I know the EU have them. Yeah, they have, but uh, we, we just had se- right. We just had six hundred thousand. and jets and We just had well, that's not a very pleasant way of talking about people. But we had six hundred thousand people just arrive in the UK. The UK government has allowed that to happen. We have control. We have sovereignty, and we're exercising it in that way. I thought take back control was we're about not sovereignty. Exercising it, are we? Because well, there we are. We the, sovere- the remain <laughs> legacy. No, 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 no. Trying no. to get back into something that was no good to us in the first place. Sovereignty. I have freedom. I have sovereignty to walk out of that door and stop talking to you and walk out of that door right now. Just because I choose not to exercise, it doesn't mean I don't have sovereignty. You try walking out that door when... Uh... No, never mind. That's a childish argument. Well, no, it's not a childish yeah, argument, Dave. I don't, I... Let's, let's grow up and talk about reality. No, but it is. I'm just saying that just because you choose not to exercise a freedom doesn't mean you don't have that freedom. We don't have sovereignty. We can't stop people coming in. No, but we, so we can, but with the British government, because we need people to work in all sorts of different industries, is choosing not we to should... exercise that doesn't mean we're not sovereign. We were sovereign before. We were sovereign so inside we, the EU, as sovereign, leaving the EU we, proved. We've because got how many boat people coming in every day? No, that's not. That destroys our sovereignty. Yeah, well, that's a different that thing. That is illegal immigration. But that's illegal immigration the of the EU. But that's nothing to do with the EU. That is yes, people, individual that's people. Where they're coming from. Yeah, but, but but just because they're coming from the EU doesn't mean that's the EU's fault. The point is, those people want to come. Those people want to come. Well, wouldn't it be better if we had a better relationship with the EU to sort it out? And they've done nothing. Yeah, but well, that's the, how I, much trust we can put in the EU. I don't know how if you noticed, Dave, but our relations with the EU have not been brilliant. Partly because we chose to leave the EU. I mean, that's our prerogative. That's indeed, our indeed. we're sovereign. Exactly. When we were always you know, sovereign. But uh, the thing is, I'm not prepared to go back into a thing where Fine. the poor people are subsidising big business. All right. Fair enough, Dave. Uh, in the Rimney Valley, great to talk to you and a robust exchange of views with what it's all about. Are you there, Jean? Yes, I'm very, very nervous and I'm very, oh, very... Oh, don't be nervous. Nothing to be nervous about, I promise you. Oh, I'm, I, because... Um, uh, I don't quite know how to say it, but what Sadiq Khan is doing 
to somebody like me I, um, is is going to completely take away my total unmitigated um, freedom. I've I've got a very old uh, Mercedes Classic. It's a lovely car, 25 years old. It, it's passed all the CO2s, but when he upped it with the NOx thing, um, it made it that it didn't comply. And I, I can't buy another one. And and if if I'm this age, and the only thing I can do is the, the basically it's my freedom, but absolutely my shopping. I can't even go shopping. D- giving us a bus is no good. How no, how, how old is you? Do you mind me asking, Jean? Every day with two bags of shopping to get. Mm shopping on a bus. I couldn't go and see any friends if they live off the bus route because it's a long walk mm. in in the night time. Of course, it would be out of the question when it gets dark at four o'clock. I mean, and, and, and my car is all right. And we don't even live in an area where there's, there's bad air. We've got the best air in lots of the outer London boroughs. Why is he doing this to us? I, well, I, I don't even need to ask you that. Because it's money. It's about money. He's trashed transport for London so badly and he's, well, and he's begged the government for money and, and they refused it. And well, then I, he's I, I inter- get himself out of a pickle before next May because then he won't get voted in again. So he's got to get this money from us. Well, Gee, no. happens. And, I, and I'm sorry, but... I'm so well. I'm I, cope. No, I, well, I'm so sorry to you. Can hear. Obviously, you you know you're really upset about it, Gene. I can totally understand. And, and we should just explain uh, for people who maybe aren't familiar with you know the geography of like London. Uh, Havering is in the very far east of the city. It's really on the Essex border. Yes. So yes. it's it's very very sort of and the, perhaps public transport not quite as good there as well. So you're more reliant on your on your and car. I can't even take my car off the driveway onto the road and go five minutes down to the corner of the road. To the sh- to the supermarket, and my shopping, and come back. That's all I want to do. It's, and you know, surely at my age, I should be able to at least do that. How old I? are you, Jean? If you don't mind asking. Sorry. How old are you? If you don't mind asking. Seventy eight. Seventy eight. And 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 the, I assume the scrappage scheme that the, the mayor has no, extended his days of no I'm use. I'm not disabled. I haven't got any disabilities. I'm not on benefits. I've been the same as I've been since I was sixty, and I'm. Obviously, I'm now that much older now, but um, he's, he's just decimating our lives. It, it is. Um, we must stop him. Is anybody going to stop him doing this to us? His, 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 his you, you know, uh, I, in, I interviewed him last week for the News Agents podcast. Sadiq, and I put some of these points to him around, you know, people who can't afford to replace their cars and, and so on. And his argument is it's not about the revenue. His argument is he's, he cares very deeply about he air quality. Clean air. He, he can say clean air till he's blue in the face and, and it doesn't mean a thing to me because we've got clean air, haven't we? Well, he says in lots of parts of the outboroughs of London, actually, the, the air quality is very bad. Because uh, he wants to get our money. I, I can't go from where I live in Havering to, to Wanstead, uh, uh, the, the City of London crematorium. I can't even go and do anything to my parents' grave because, because I'll, I'll be charged to go there, won't I? And I and, well, look, £12.50 a day is £87.50 a week, Thirty. £350 a month. Mm. Is that what he wants to do to me if I keep it? I understand. Gina, I, well, people have heard how, um, how you know, how much it's affected you and how passionate you are about it. So um, with the mayor's listening, he will have heard it. And, uh, and you, you definitely speak for a lot of people. There are arguments, obviously, on, around air quality, and we've had them on the show before, but uh, we've heard you know, loud and clear that this is a, always with a big tax change. It can affect people and affect people's lives substantially. Jeannie and Havering there, um, uh, nothing to be nervous about. I hope you uh, agree at the end there. I mean, I'm just an average person that has worked hard all our life ever since I was kind of 17 years of age. Mm. And, you know, I've worked hard. I've, you know, I've grown up. I've got my own business and all the rest of it. And I don't see why, you know, I should pay inheritance tax on that. I've paid tax all my life. And just because I did well at it doesn't mean to say I'm not, you know, one of these top rich and famous in the top 10% of the country. I'm just an average Joe that worked hard all her life. And well, I don't see why I should have to pay it. Well, Sharon, if you ended up in the, you could argue, the very fortunate position of having to pay inheritance tax, then by definition, you would be in the top 4% of the country because only 4% of households pay it. Yeah, but 
you know, why should I? I've well, paid tax all my life, so why should I pay a tax again? But you're not paying a tax. It's the person who is inheriting it who's paying the tax. You're yeah, not, well, you're so, dead. So, so why, they sh- why should they pay because they don't deserve what it. I've paid? You, you've just said it yourself. Yes, you they wor- do, because no, 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 he's don't. worked... My you... son, why should my... My son's worked hard all his life. Yeah, so why he gets to keep all his income. Tax so, on... So you know what I would prefer? I prefer he gets to keep more. We should increase things like inheritance tax and lower the income tax on your for your son so he can keep more of his income as he's working as opposed to letting his children keep more of his income or stock of income when he's dead. No, because you're, you're just thinking, no, because I don't see that that's fair. I've paid Why? tax all my life on my money yeah. that I've, I've left to him so yeah. that it gives him a better life. Yeah, but he does. But why the, why so should two... he then pay tax on that again? Well, he's already going to. If you let's let's imagine that you leave an estate of of uh, a million pounds, right? And let's yeah. imagine you leave that estate with your. I don't know if you've got a partner or, or whatever, but like let's imagine for the sake of argument that that you do. That means that seven hundred thousand pounds of your estate, say through your house, he'll get tax free anyway. It's, in, it's only 40% in every pound above that threshold. So he's already going to do very, very well. I think in those circumstances, this hy- not personalising, but let's say this hypothetical son is already going to do very, very well, far better than anybody could hope to expect. It's only the state then saying, well, we're going to tax a bit of that very lucky inheritance back, perhaps to help with schools and hospitals and so on. Yeah, but I've already paid tax all my life yeah, on that I... money towards schools and hospitals and all the rest of it. Why should I pay it again? Well, not or pay- why should Sharon, he pay it No, because again? you're not paying it again. He's paying no, it for the first time. but he would pay it. Yeah, he would pay but it. He's all, but but he's... he's already... But I've already paid tax on that money. But you don't get to say... We don't get to say as individuals, right, exactly where and where we get to pay tax, right? The whole point is, is that you're not paying it again. There's no double taxation. He is paying it to receive it rather than you paying it on your working of it. But I've already paid tax on that money. But you may not have done. But you may not have paid a pound of tax on it. Because, for example, if a lot of people's inherit... No, because because they won't. Because a lot of people's inheritance tax or their estate come from... House prices, right? House prices that have appreciated in wealth. So if you bought your house, I don't know, that one person's bought their house for £100,000, say, I don't know, 1980 or something, and then they pass it on to their son or daughter for a million pounds in 2023, they will have not paid tax on almost any of that because it will have all come from capital appreciation, which isn't subject to capital gains. But they've still worked hard in order yeah. to pay that mortgage. Yeah, but the mortgage is tiny. The, the, they're not getting the mortgage value. They're getting the capital appreciation the mortgage, value. Not necessarily, because the mortgage, you know... And what if they haven't worked hard? Money for their mortgage. And what if they haven't worked hard? What if they've just basically... What if that person actually just got a house because they inherited wealth, because their father inherited wealth, because their father inherited wealth. That is the definition of inherited privilege. Someone may have worked hard, what, 500 years ago, but we've got to keep respecting that. Yeah, but why would you penalise them because of that? Well, because, because, because it's not fair for other people, because we're trying to create a meritocracy. Yeah, but we're trying to create a meritocracy in this country. We're trying to make want, sure... But you also want people to be... Um, entrepreneurs and get up and, and live life for themselves. You don't expect to just have handouts. But you, but, but a handout is literally inheritance. Ta- inheritance. That's what a handout yeah, is. It might incentivize your son to be more of an entrepreneur if he wasn't receiving seven hundred grand from you in inheritance. Go and work for himself. Well, I don't. Dis- I disagree with that. Well, one. that's fair enough. Appreciate your call, Sir Sharon. This story. It's in the Telegraph today. It would be in the Telegraph, wouldn't it? Um, talking about the fact that. Single people at Michelin star restaurants, i.e. solo diners, are now going to be asked to pay for two people. This comes off the back of Alex Dilling, a Mayfair restaurant on the first floor of the Hotel Café Royale, which opened in September 2022, charging single diners the minimum cost of a table for two for its tasting menu, which is currently £350. Couples, however, are asked to pay the same cost split between them. That's also the case for lunches, where a single diner pays £170, where those dining as a pair are charged £85. The restaurant has insisted that the minimum spend was not a solo supplement, adding, basically, we only have 11 tables in the restaurant, which means that we do require a minimum spend for two people for solo diners. So they think many Michelin-style restaurants will go the same way. And and this got, got us thinking about this wider issue about being single. I mean, you know, dining in a Michelin-style restaurant for the vast, vast majority of people is neither here nor there. But there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever 
that being single in the UK at the moment is basically, never mind not being able to, die, to have an account at Coots, is basically the worst thing you can do for your financial health. Because on almost every measure, on every single way, if you're single, the chances are you're going to be paying more. You're paying a solo premium. Indeed, if we take a far more significant thing than dining, housing, just early this year, uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne, the uh, broker, mortgage broker, said that single people are forced to spend £860 more a month on the cost of living than those in couples. Cost of rent, groceries, household bills, much higher for single people living alone compared with uh, couples. Single, but on average, a single person would spend £1,851 per month on typical bills, over 1800 quid a month. And that this is from, I think, some months ago now. It's probably even higher, including on things like food, internet, Netflix, etc. But someone in a couple would spend just £991 on the same services. And that makes complete sense when you think about it, right? Obviously, it's just complete, complete common sense. Obviously, if you're paying rent, then you have it. Netflix account, only one of you needs it. Food, there's going to be no wastage and so on and so forth. And it happens on holiday as well with travel, with people often having to pay um, solo supplements uh, in uh, hotels and other places as well, restaurants, travel, and so on. And there's, I think, no doubt that... Uh, I mean, I've spoken to you know single friends of mine who feel this completely acutely, that they feel that not only in some way is society kind of a diff- bit more difficult for you because you're single and people ask you awkward questions and all this sort of thing, but there is quite literally a financial penalty i mean what hope i mean it's difficult enough for couples to be able to buy a flat or a house or whatever it is these days very very little prospect unless you've got a very good income of doing so on your own i mean i remember i've had older colleagues in the past you know who are obviously buying their flats or houses and they live alone um then and now and they were buying them in the 80s and the 90s or whatever completely unthinkable now completely unthinkable really unless as i say you were in an extremely really good income kind of coots money mr farage um that you would be able to do that and yet it's not something that we ever think about. We saw it in the pandemic, didn't we, all the time. And so much of our politics is always about hardworking families, hardworking families. So much of pandemic policy was geared around basically the kind of, you know, nuclear family, mom and dad or mom and mom and dad and dad and the kids or whatever it is. But the sort of person who lives on their own and not even really talking here about, say, pensioners, but certainly, you know, younger people who, for whatever reason, maybe, they've, maybe they have been in a relationship, maybe they've not, whatever it is, but they're living alone. And it's really, really difficult. And yet it's not something that we really, really ever talk about. I lost my dear wife after nearly 57 years of uh, of marriage. Um, and I um, initially was obviously in shock and mm. I developed certain um, illnesses and uh, a lot of problems with grieving. And I developed mental health. But bringing me up to date... I've got through my mental health issue, and I've got that. I've got through quite a lot of the grieving. And um, all along, um, I believed that with loneliness, um, you have to believe in yourself that you you are wanting to try and do the best for yourself in the circumstances. I've not no family. Uh, I'm on my own after all these years, and it was a shock. Um, mm. When did you when but, did you lose your wife, John? Uh, December uh, twenty one, thirty right. December twenty one. It's about eighteen uh, months ago. Yeah, yeah, and um, for about the first twelve months, it was very it was difficult. Of but course. I believed I believed in people who wanted to help me, um, and I started to um, get involved with um, certain charities who put me in touch with. Complete strangers who are now my best friends, um, who write to me, uh, telephone me, um, video Zoom. We talk over over a video and um, uh, every week. Uh, and through through their contact with me, it has encouraged me to do better. And it is it made me make a decision about four months ago, and that was for the memory of my dear wife. I, I would not do anything stupid. I would be positive. I would believe in myself. M- my wife is with me all the time. Mm. No matter where I am, she's with me. I feel a presence. Um, she supports me. And uh, we talk a lot. And um, I've developed a lot of hobbies. And um, 
things like painting, drawing, um, painting by painting by numbers, writing, um, and I, I've, I've improved my reading. I go out for walks. Mm. I, I haven't joined any social groups at the minute because I'm not. I don't feel I'm quite ready for that, but I'm mm. trying to build my strength up through my. It's not independence, but through my my group that I've got together. Self confidence. Who, yes, self confidence who support me, but to anybody who is in my position where you've lost a dear one, I'll always remember that they're with you, and I'll always remember that they would want you to do your best for yourself, and they they will always look down on you, and they will they will they will always care over you, and don't be alone, don't feel alone, but when you feel alone. Try, try and look at positives. Um, I, I have some problems with positivity and negativity, but over time, I, I've managed to get rid of, of nearly all the negatives that I had uh, over over the shock of losing my wife. And, and, and most of my things now are positive. Um, I feel down. You get down. You feel you have days where you, you don't want to do nothing. But when you get in that situation, just just put the, that foot forward in front of your right, and, and just kind of concentrate and try and try and do your best. Yeah, don't, don't life is not a mountain; it can be a hill. It, it can be something that you have you have. If you don't want to do something, don't do it. If you want to just sit down, sit down. If you want to go out, go go out. But believe in yourself. I, I know it's easy to say. It's easy for me to say to you, believe in yourself. But please trust me. I find it works for me. Um, and, and by believing in myself, I've built up my confidence. And, and, and I, I, I honestly, the days go by, I, I don't get bored because... I've got new things to do. I've got new ventures. I've got letters to write. I've got drawing to do. I've got writing to do. And, 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 and various other things that, that I take on board. And, and, and by, by believing in myself, by believing that my wife would want me to do what I'm doing, it's made me feel more confident in myself. Now, I'm not saying that's going to everybody's going to get the same response because it, it affects different people in different ways. Mm. You know, it, it's, not, it's not a one-fit measure for everybody. And I understand, I understand when people feel low and they feel down. But please remember, tomorrow will be a better day. And, and, and that, that's, how, that's how I work. If I want to cry, I cry. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to tell anybody I've cried my eyes out because that is love coming out to me from my wife. That's an expression of my love for my wife. And, and I've been out and I've started crying. And I'm not ashamed. Well, you shouldn't. And I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not ashamed now to talk to you um, or anybody else about it. But there is a, there is a better tomorrow. And, and, and just don't think every day is a mountain. You've got to climb a mountain. You haven't got to climb a mountain. You can get by by climbing a hill. And that's really, Lewis, all I want to say. But from the bottom of my heart to those people like me, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. It hasn't got to be. It's sadness to lose somebody you love. That person is always with you. And I wish everybody in my situation all the best. And you, you look after yourself and try and do what you can for yourself. Sure. And you will find that you'll have bad days and you'll have good days. But when the bad days come, just believe in that you can get over them. John, John, can I ask you, what was, what was your wife's name? Sorry. What was your wife's name, John? If you don't mind asking. Sheila. 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 I think John. We met. We met on a. We met on a blind date. 
Oh, really? In 1965, we met in the March. We got married in the October the same year. Wow. Got 57 years together, and I couldn't have had a better wife. And she she made she made me into who I was, who I am then now. She made me into a better person. I loved the socks off her. She she was the soul of my life. She was my 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 love. She was everything to me. And um, I would go through the fifty-seven years again. And I, I we had our ups and downs. Who didn't? You know, we we all we all get it. We all lived through it. But we believed in each other, and uh, we lived our life together. And well, uh, love her now. She's resting in peace, but I can see her now as I'm talking to you. I want to talk about a young politician, though, and there's not any young proto Winston Churchills out there. It is uh, Keir Mather, who, as I was saying, extraordinary. He's uh, MP, now baby of the house, uh, youngest MP. He's not the youngest ever, by the way. He's 25. There have been uh, others younger than that. Charles Kennedy was younger than that when he was baby of the house. Murray Black was younger than that when she was a baby of the house, contrast to father and mother of the house, um, of course. Um, but of course, his age has ended up being something of an issue in this campaign. I know it was brought up a little bit locally by the local Conservative Party, obviously had no impact whatsoever. The voters of Selby uh, endorsing him very, very, um, very, very profoundly there in a major way. A bit of a landslide for him, really. Um, but it came up even as late as last night in the early hours of the morning. And most of you probably weren't glued to the by-election coverage overnight shame on you but there was this extraordinary exchange from johnny mercer who's a a conservative mp plymouth mp uh a minister and he uh was doing representing the conservatives on that program and he had his own let's let's call it a take shall we a take of what keir mather's age means and why he wasn't especially comfortable with it in the house of commons listen to this I think it's always good to get new people in, in politics. I mean, I, I think we mustn't become a sort of uh, repeat of the in-betweeners, right? So um, I think you've got to have people who what have do you mean by that? done stuff. Well, this guy has, has, you know, he's been at Oxford University more than he's been in a job. Um, he, he, you put a chip in him there and he just relates Labour lines. And the problem is people have kind of had enough of that, right? They want people who are authentic, people who've worked in that constituency, um, who, who know what life is like, understand what life is like, uh, you know, to live, work and, uh, and, and raise a family in communities like theirs. Um, so no, I'm afraid, I, I, you know, I, I don't agree with this style of politics. It's exactly why people like me didn't vote before the 2015 election, because you've got people with nothing to do with the constituency just dropped in and, you know, put a chip in them and they'll start parroting Labour Party politics. Mr. Uh, Mercer went on to say that how could, for example, a young person like Keir Mather have any understanding of, you know, cost of living issues and everything uh, like that. I found that the most extraordinary exchange, frankly. I mean, first of all, it was... I mean, by the way, I should preface this by saying I, I actually like Johnny Mercer. I, I think he's an interesting person in the House of Commons. He's got lots of passions and he's represented particularly uh, military and veterans affairs extremely ably in his parliamentary career since he, since he came into Parliament. But I have to say, let, maybe that was a bit of an off-colour moment at four or five o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. But I think the condescension to a young man who obviously cares deeply about politics, who's gone into the House of Commons, who's given up his time, who's made extraordinary application to become elected, was, frankly, the condescension was dripping. And it was completely inappropriate. I think probably Mr Mercer owes Mr Mather uh, an apology. Quite frankly, the idea that a 25-year-old isn't able to represent people well in the House of Commons. I tell you this, we need more 25-year-olds in the House of Commons. We need more 30-year-olds. We've got plenty. What, what do we want? More 60 year old geezers because we've got plenty of those. Believe me, we've got plenty of men in their late 50s and 60s who, by the way, have all done quite similar things. They've been in management consultancy and this, that and the other or in the city or in business. I'm not saying we don't need them. But how many MPs have we got who are under 30? Very, very few in any given time. And I'll say this. Maybe if we did have more MPs who are under 30, maybe in terms of issues around age and issues around the way that our broken economy completely screws young people in so many ways, maybe things would be better. Maybe we'd have better situation to, for renters, for example. Maybe we'd have a better situation in terms of student loans. Maybe we'd have a better situation in terms of transport and where young people are and the fact they have to go to work. Instead of a politics which is increasingly dominated by people who are over 65, and that includes, or over 60, and that includes, by the way, the House of Commons. Not understand cost of living issues? Young people are at the forefront of cost of living issues. 
Has anyone checked what rent is recently for young people? They're the ones at the forefront of it. It's not people who've already paid off their mortgage who are at the centre of the cost of living crisis, by the way. It's young people who are either trapped in unbelievably expensive rental accommodation in contracts which are not in any way advantageous to them, who are trapped in having to do that, who are trying to scrape every penny together to maybe get on the housing ladder. And by the way, maybe when they do, then the mortgage crisis that we've currently got comes and hits them. We need more young people in the House of Commons. And quite frankly, as well, let's, let's just say that uh, people in glass houses really shouldn't throw stones. Because let's not forget the reason that that by-election was even happening in the first place. The only reason that Mr Keir Mather is even a Labour MP right now at all is because Mr Nigel Adams, a Conservative, I forget, I don't know how old he was, I think he's in his 50s. The only reason why Adams isn't there anymore and Mather is an MP is because Nigel Adams got off in a total huff, went off in a total mood because he wasn't given a peerage by Rishi Sunak. Is that the sort of experience and the sort of person that we want in the House of Commons? Someone who goes off in a total mood because he's not going to be put in the legislature for life? And by the way, again, talking about glass houses, I'm a hobby horse here, I accept, but talking about glass houses, what about the situation where the Conservative Party apparently has no issue whatsoever putting a 29-year-old and 31-year-old in the House of Lords? That is supposed to be this upper house full of experience. Well, if it's a problem having a 25-year-old elected member of the Commons, who, by the way, the good people, the voters of Selby and Ainsley can choose to dispense with his services, services whenever they choose when the next election comes... None of us can do anything about these young Conservative peers who've just put in the House of Lords for life, for the next 50 years, voting on laws over us with no accountability whatsoever. So let's just think a little bit before we start going down that road. And I think, to be honest, what it reflects is what I think is a deeply inverse ageism which takes place often in this country. And young people are often told to just dismiss their concerns, are dismissed, told to just sort of shut up. They're sort of woke and all of this sort of stuff. The media, the press do it the whole time. Politics does it. You know what? It would be a really, really good idea if we had more 20-year-olds, more 30-year-olds, etc. in the House of Commons and the media for that matter as well. Because I think they bring more life experience than many, many people who are much older than them. My son was attacked by a friend's family dog about uh, 10, 11 weeks ago now. Sorry to hear that. On a, on a Sunday. He asked if he could go around for an hour, uh, PlayStation stuff or whatever, dropped him off. Uh, 15 minutes later, <clears throat> had a call from my wife, get back to my son. The dogs attacked him. <clears throat> so I arrived uh, straight up the stairs, opened the door, and uh, it was horrific. It wasn't a... It was a bully cross, crossed with another... Um, terrier type dog but right. still like a bully face type of thing he had a chunk at the back of his car about the size of a satsuma that Gosh. was gone he had another one even bigger at the side of his ankle puncture wounds all down his uh right leg and uh <clears throat> um called the paramedics i I sort of dealt with the first aid type of thing. There's nobody else apart from the two lads in the house. And uh, he had like 46 stitches taken out of the... In 46 stitches on the inside of his wounds. Gosh. And 34 taken from the outside of his legs. Oh, my <laughs> word. It's dreadful. <clears throat> I've never seen anything like it in... And how old was the lad, Lee? How old was he? My lad's 13. 13. 13. That must have been absolutely terrifying for him and for you. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. He got sort of football shorts on. They were gone, torn to shreds. Dog was trying to get back through the door, apparently, before I got there. How long did it last? Uh, not, not long, not long. But they could, if, you'd have, if, you'd have, if you'd have fallen over, yeah. um, I, I couldn't tell you what would have happened. But the, those chunks are gone. They, they, they weren't on the floor as such to be picked up and sewn or whatever. They're gone. Dog and, ate, uh, ate them? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happened to the dog, Lee? What happened to the owner and the dog? A uh, complicated story. The, the dog was taken away and was it was held for about three or four weeks because um, he couldn't be put to sleep. Because it, it, 
uh, it was somebody else's property is how they put it to us. So as as the time went on, um, a PC went round uh, from Leicester, I believe, and took a folder with him and sort of left the photos of my son's injuries open and uh, the owner didn't sort of quite realise what a, how bad it had been and uh, she's she signed the paperwork for the dog to be destroyed. The, the, the chap who was dealing with it said that the, the dog in the kennels uh, where it was being held uh, was um, trying to rip the cage open. Any time anybody walked past, it was going mad. I mean, it's a family. Fa- everybody's saying, oh, it depends on the owners. This is a, a decent family. We're in mm. a decent area. Um, they're on a a nightly basis now, my son wakes up in the night screaming, sweating, nightmares. He's got scars he'll <clears throat> keep for life. Um, he's totally changed. He's gone from outgoing. Um, he's sort of withdrawn. Um, he, he, he wakes up and said he can he can still feel the dog <clears throat> attacking him. Flashbacks. Uh We've got a cocker spaniel. Our family dog is a cocker spaniel. He's a is a therapy dog for our local hospital. I'm a volunteer with him. Uh, I don't. I can't see why you even want something like that around. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. What's wrong with a, a, a Labrador or a Retriever? Yeah, or, normal dog. I, I don't know. So, yeah, I, I can't understand the, no. the and, mentality. And Lee. Um... Uh, two questions, really. One, I mean, it's needless to say, I assume you think these dogs should be banned. But secondly, um, how's your boy doing now? And I mean, you said obviously he's struggling a bit, but I mean, how hopeful no, are not, you that he's going to make not, a recovery? It's not, he'll make a recovery physically. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely suffering from PTSD. Gosh. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. He's gone yeah. from, he's just been awarded a Pride Award from our lo- his local school for his attitude through the last term and the last year of education. Fantastic. He's a really high achieving lad, but he, that is, we've already had a call from the school to say he's sort of zoning out. He has to take himself away at times because he gets so upset. Of course. Must be such a shock, it, such a psych, such a trauma. Uh, um, I can't get, I can't, uh, I can't get walking through that door and see my son screaming out to me, you know, help me, Dad, please help me. I t- when I turned his leg over to see the injury, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it, full stop. Luckily, we've got the children's hospital close to us and they got a plastic surgeon team that had already been in hospital that mm. day. And they stayed over to, to do the surgery. Otherwise, you would have had, a, I think they said they would have had skin grafts and all that sort of stuff. Um, but he went on and on and on and, you know, weekly visits, wound nurses, and uh, we, 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 there's an attack in Birmingham on a, a young girl last week. There's nothing compared to what my son's gone through. And it's uh, it's, <clears throat> it's going to be a lifelong thing. He's scared of dogs now. Well, of course. You know, certain, certain dogs, you know, staffy-type dogs, they are, you know, I just don't understand why you would, we, we live by Sutton Park, a it, it, well-known huge yep. park. Like it's the biggest Europe park in Europe, mm. public park in Europe. And uh, you, you see lads walking around, you know, 18, 25, with these, the dogs are not on leads, they're on chains. Mm. Yeah, what, what, I, don't, I, don't, I don't sort of get it. You know, I'm mm. sort of walking along with my little spaniel sort of thing. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Well, so, But there you go. Lee, I've rang in a few times actually, just to just to uh, bring you up because yeah. it's. Um... Well, you were very grateful that you did, Lee, because you've really brought to life just uh, how serious an issue this is, and uh, all our very best to you and your son. Not easy to get over it, but it sounds like he, he's dealing with it in the in the best way that anybody could, in an exemplary way. There are no words that describe the horrors that are playing out in Palestine at the moment. For most of the, I would think, the general public of this country and across the world, there are no words left to describe what is happening every day, every minute, to this population of Gaza and also the West Bank. It's absolutely disgraceful. There is no fuel, there is no electricity, the, the, there's sewage in the streets, there's no place to run and there's no place to hide. It is 
actually a genocide. Why? Because people are being told where to go. Movements of population. The healthcare system is completely dismantled. It's, it's not there. Yeah. And it's a slow, torturous death if you're not blasted. But you would, I mean, but is Jenny, would you accept the logic to say that it is very difficult for Israel and the Israeli government to say no more as long as those hostages are being released? Hamas should just release the hostages. I don't think they're doing a very good job of protecting their hostages by bombing and blasting every inch of glass. Sure, but you would agree that Hamas should release the hostages and that might get us a bit further along. There are no military outcomes here for the Israelis. But you would agree that Hamas should release the hostages? I, 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 I think this genocide needs... I think why wouldn't, why wouldn't you just say stop. that Hamas should release the hostages? That's just like an absolute basic, right? Those innocent people that are being held. I think there's been there's twelve thousand people dead. We've got yeah, but let's not do what about really. Like like you know what I find frustrating about this debate? What a human life is a human life. A hu- an Israeli yeah. being uh, Israeli being held at gunpoint by Hamas is just as tragic and being killed in that circumstance as a Palestinian being killed by an Israeli bomb. You would agree? I think we. Look at the law. We need to look at proportionality. No, no, but you we? would agree what I, what I just said that a life is a life. I think that the bloodshed needs to stop. Why would you, you just agree with that? You know what, Jenny? You're part of the problem with this debate. Like, why? I do not understand how you could you couldn't just agree with those statements. A life is a life, whether it's a Palestinian life or an Israeli life. No. To your previous caller. Uh, I would like to say that all of the marches that have taken place. No, in no, London, no, but no. Forget I about the caller. I'm asking you a question about whether uh, a life is a life. Absolutely. And when you're talking about an excess of 12,000 lives, we're looking at proportionality. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I, I, I think, so let me tell you, so let me tell you, let me tell you, my, so right my now. position, so my position is, is that the fighting should stop. Hamas should, yes. they should release, should release the hostages and give an undertaking that this is not going to happen. October the 7th is not going to happen again. And then the Israelis stop the bombing. What's wrong with that? I'd like to ask you a question. No, no, I'm Would asking you, you a question. Why on earth wouldn't you say? Why wouldn't you? Why on, why, well, fine. But why on earth wouldn't you agree, Jenny? Why, on, Jenny? I'm sorry. I have asked you. I tell you what. I tell you what. How would you feel? How would you feel if one of your relatives was being held at gunpoint by a Hamas fighter? And you're just. And I, I've asked you. I've asked you. I have asked you. I've asked you just to say that uh, you think those hostages should be released, and you have several times demurred from doing so what kind of position is that you're happy so you think those hostages should be kept where they are do you know what i actually think i don't know what you say i don't know what you're going to come out with here talking is over ceasefire ceasefire and release the hostages to all of those people i find you you know what jenny i find your i find your dismissal of a particular life because of the type of life that it is chilling in the extreme and disturbing i think we're going to leave it there both you and your contributor um, fail to accept that different age groups might have ex- might have experienced something differently. If I just give you just a short, uh, I bought a house 30, 30 odd years ago. Mm-hmm. I lost ten thousand pounds on that house within two years mm-hmm. because of negative equity. I paid sixteen and a half percent interest. Could you tell? Could you tell me how it is that I'm better off than people today, even at four and a half percent, where it is? How, how is it that you... you Shall I tell you why? You, 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 you can't tell me why, because anything, tell, no, other, no, no, anything no. other than accepting that I've had it difficult... No, diff, I've got children that are the age group that you're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you... If, if you fail, why is it, how is it now so popular that people go out, drink coffee, get their nails done, their eyelashes done... They can freely spend their money on whatever they do, and my children did you do. Not, did you not have coffee back in the 70s, Robert? You don't have any I coffee? Wouldn't have, I wouldn't have paid four or five pounds for a, for a Well, no, for that, a would have, that would have been unlikely, given the inflation of differences. And, 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 I won't, and I won't pay it now. Well, well, good for you. But shall I tell you why the, you're wrong on, in terms of what are the difference? The difference is, yes, you may have been paying briefly, has to be said, not consistently, briefly, 15% interest rates. The difference is mm-hmm. now is that even with interest rates at 4 or 5%, in real yeah. terms, that is a bigger burden for people, someone taking out a mortgage today because of the difference in house prices. When you were buying your house, whenever yeah. it was, back in a few decades ago, when you were buying your house, relative yeah. house prices were only three to four or maybe five times yeah. average income. Now they are seven, eight, nine or ten times yeah. average income. You're, you're, so in you're, real you're, terms... You're, you're basing that on the knowledge that you know everybody's income, aren't you? See, what you're no, doing, no, it's called an average. No, no, That's why I'm using no, no, the word average. No, no, what you're doing... I obviously, I don't know everybody's income. I, I don't have a 
a piece you're, of paper here fi- saying you're that. Failing, you're failing to accept that the possibility is that just my age group and yours and my children's have all got different challenges to bear. Yeah, of course and everybody that, has different challenges. Of course they do. I've said that at the very are. beginning. But I'm talking... We've so, got, but, Robert, we've got to talk... The point is, is that we've got to talk generally and looking at the mm-hmm. economic data across generations. Of course, people within the generations are going to have different challenges and they're going to be rich people, they're going to be poor people. Different generations will have different challenges. Mm-hmm. Of course, no generation has it completely easy. Of course they don't. But what, mm-hmm. I, find, what, I, what I struggle to understand is why people like yeah. yourself, with respect, don't yeah. acknowledge just on the basis of the empirical data that on house prices, on wages, which are the things that matter most, is that the generation below you and the one yeah. below that has had it much more difficult than your own. No, I don't believe that. Yeah, but you might not not believe it. It's just fact. It doesn't matter what you believe. It's not fact because you're not considering that whilst my daughter's at university, because I don't, because I have, uh, I'm married and have stayed married for the years that I have, because I'm a homeowner, now I'm having to fund my daughter's accommodation for five to six to seven thousand pounds a year. Uh, My parents, my parents didn't have to do that. Yeah. But, so well, there you go. But I'm talking so, about uh, wages and I'm talking about no, house prices. But, my, but my, my, my wages at the age that I am are having to be spent on other things that people in their 40s but, aren't even considering. But, but when, right did you buy, when did you buy your house, Robert? I just I said to you about 30 years ago. 30 years ago. How much has it gone up in value since then? I'm not in the same house, am I? Obviously. Well, OK, well, how much do you think you've... You, so you've consistently got... You've consistently sort of bought up, right? I, there is I, no I, way I we're going to see house price appreciation, the oh, sort of which that your generation has enjoyed. How much, did you, how much did you buy your first house for? How much did I buy? It was about £58,000. £58,000. The average house price today has accelerated in that, yeah. in real terms, by, fa- by, yeah. by an enormous amount. So, and what am I, I going to have to do with my house if I have to go into a home. Me, because I've spent, I've spent all well, my life... Well, at least life, you're going to have that. What's my generation going to have? We're not even going to have a home if, to do that. If, That's if, the point if, I'm if, making. No, well, you're, you're missing the point. No, no, because if, you, you just if don't, you don't want to hear home, it. If you, don't, you, if you don't have a home to go in, you'll get trundled off to a, to a care home... Oh, good. ...that my house will be taken away from me. That's oh, no. <laughs> point about in, so you'll about get to, so tax. you'll get to choose. You'll get to choose the sort of care that you have and have a good quality care. I won't and be hope able that, to afford Hope the rest of us. You know, but I just don't oh. understand why it is that, that people of your generation simply aren't able to accept the empirical facts. You say you don't believe it. It's just a fact. You know what? Like well, I said, what I said to Rachel Cunliffe, it's absolutely fine. Good luck to you. I am so glad that you had that house price increase and you benefited from it. <laughs> I'm so glad that you had the price that you had stable. Uh, I'm so glad that your there was real price, uh, real wage yeah. growth in that time. So glad. Yeah. Good for you. I just wish we'd had it the same, and I just wish you would recognise that the no, generations you below you, you have not you enjoyed those things. It's just you, fact. You don't, know that, you don't know that you won't have it the same. You well, we've had 13 years. We have 15 years since the financial crisis. We haven't had it. A whole generation's already been scarred. There's no recovery from that. It's already affected permanently people's long-term yeah. wage growth. That is a fact. So the prices of houses didn't go down last month, then? They went down for one month, Robert. They went down for one month. Do you think that's going to reverse literally 15 to 20 years of this stuff? Went out for one month, be- mate. Because, because it did 30 years ago. Because it's happened before. You're, right. you're missing... Okay. It, 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 so you it, think it's going to go back down to 58 grand, the average, when you bought your house? You think the average house, which is currently over a quarter of a million pounds, is going to go back down to 58 grand anytime soon? Well, it might, might it? OK, maybe it might. Lots of things might happen. Thank you, Robert.